subtract from any of Dr. Conrad's time. And I know some of you are still waiting on seats. We're getting those set up for you, so we should have you comfortable as soon as possible here. But wanted to go ahead and, and get this started. Um, welcome to our campus. I'm Rachel Lloyd, and I direct our Advisement Center and our Title III grant program. And on behalf of ACE and NEO, welcome to our campus, and I hope you enjoy today's uh, presentation by Dr. Conrad. I know we've all been really looking forward to it. And uh, he's essentially volunteering his time here today. Uh, got stuck at the airport yesterday several times and barely made it in by 3 a.m. So we just really, really appreciate him being here with us today to give us a little uh, presentation on some of his, his adventures. Um, I wanted to let you know, though, if you do have class around noon and you need to slip out quietly, that's fine. Just try to be as respectful as possible. Also, remember to silence your cell phones. And now I'm going to invite up here one of our, uh, our graduates, Mr. Brad Claggett. And he is going to introduce our speaker. Um, Brad graduated with a degree in natural science from NEO and is continuing to take some classes as he tutors in our tutoring center. Uh, he has been interested in paleontology since he was a young boy and plans to pursue a career in the field after obtaining his bachelor's degree. So he's going to come on up and introduce our speaker. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, I wanted to thank you and a uh, friend of mine, Sam, uh, for uh, getting me this opportunity and letting me meet uh, Dr. Conrad, J uh, Jack, rather. Um, Dr. Jack Conrad of the Choctaw Tribe, research associate in the Department of Vertebrae Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and an assistant professor of anatomy at NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine. Jack received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2005, where he studied with the well-known reptile anatomist, paleontologist, Oliver Ripple, is that correct? Olivier Ripple. Olivier Ripple, thank you. In 2006, he co-curated Lizards and Snakes Alive, a traveling exhibition that featured more than 60 live and fossil reptiles. Uh, Conrad has traveled the world studying living and fossil squamata, which are lizards and snakes, and digging up fossils, which is a big interest of mine. He has been on major paleontological expeditions in the American West, Ellesmere Island, northern, which is northern Canada, uh, the Sahara of Niger, the Andes of Bolivia, and Rusinga Island, which is Kenya. He has helped discover new dinosaur species, crocodile, pterosaur, mammal, and the unusual, a common term, fishapod. It's a tiktalic. Jack has provided biology enrichment for rural schools in southwest Missouri and for inner school kids in Chicago. A native of the Ozarks, he enjoys creek swimming, frog gigging, football, and travel. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jack Conrad. Well, thanks very much. That was an excellent introduction. I appreciate it. And basically, I don't need to talk now. You know everything there is to know about me. Um, can everybody hear okay? I'm not used to being tied to a podium, so usually I'm walking around. So. I have two mics here, so I don't think I can do that. Um, you know, uh, Rachel mentioned that I got kind of hung up in airports last night and stuff and, and didn't get a whole lot of sleep, but that's, that's not going to be an excuse. Um, I was thinking about it this morning. There's a lot more inhospitable places to be stuck, and this wasn't the way I was going to you know, start my talk, but... Um, in 2004, we spent five and a half weeks in the Arctic, so it was so far north that the sun just goes around in a circle in the sky all the time. And so it's daytime for about three and a half months. And once, once daytime starts to become day versus night, you know, at the, at basically in August, um, as soon as that sun dips behind the horizon, you lose about 40 or 50 degrees in temperature, and we were living in tents. Um, and we had to be helicoptered in and out of this place, so everything's dependent on weather. And at the end of our five and a half weeks, we'd been socked in with fog for about four weeks. <laughs> and so the helicopters couldn't get us. And we had a 10-day buffer at the end of this trip before the sun was going to start going behind the horizon. 
And you know, about five and a half days into this 10-day uh, buffer, we're starting to get nervous. <laughs> and it was starting to get where we couldn't see the sun part of the day. It was getting around zero. And, and so that kind of puts last night in perspective, right? <laughs> I sat on a plane for a few hours. I think I was OK. Anyway, um, the, real, the real way I wanted to start talking today is to thank everyone for coming out. I know it's kind of nasty weather out there. It's unpleasant. Um, it's amazing to have so many people here. I really appreciate it. Um, and I just, normally when I'm talking these days, it's in front of, uh, it's at a conference or something where it has to be really technical, or I'm talking to first year medical students about guts. And so to be able to just talk about some science that I find interesting is a real pleasure for me. And it's, it's also a pleasure to, to be here um, in an area where there are a lot of people of Native American ancestry. Uh, this is my grandma and grandpa, and you can probably tell that my grandpa on the, on the right in this photo is uh, Clarence Pemberton. He's the, he's the one from which I get my Choctaw heritage. So it's cool to be able to talk with people um, more similar in background to me. There's not a whole lot of Choctaw people or Native Americans in Manhattan. And also from a lot of, to a lot of people from small towns. This is my hometown. This is Hurley, Missouri. Um, and that's accurate. That's actually measured in... Uh, feet down there at the bottom, a thousand feet. So this town is, is I think, the smallest town in Missouri with the K through 12 school. Um, it's a fantastic place, beautiful place. Many of you guys know small towns and are, are used to small towns and have grown up in small towns. And, and you know how wonderful a small town can be and, and how alluring it is to stay there your entire life. And, and you can have a very fulfilled life in a small town. But sometimes people get the mistaken impression that if they want something different, they can't have it if they come from a small town. If you come from, my graduating class was 17. Um, so, you know, some people from my hometown might believe that they can't go out and do something different if they want to. And that's just not true. You can, it doesn't matter where you come from. If you're determined and you can find something that drives you in your life and you go after it and you can find the right people to help you to just be your support network like your family or your friends, you can go anywhere. At, when I, after I graduated from high school in Hurley, I went to a small liberal arts college. Uh, now it's called Drury University. At the time, it was Drury College. Again, a fantastic place. Um, there are pluses and minuses to going to a small school. There may not be that much opportunity to do research at a small school. But if you can the, um, find good professors, and you're more likely to at a small school because they're going to know their students much better. They're not going to just know them as their student number. They're going to know them by name and interest. If you can find good professors, people that are willing to help you, um, show them your passion, show them what you're interested in, and they may be able to work with you. And it's because I had that type of interaction with my professors, especially uh, Drs. Rowley, Wing, and um, Jones at, at Drury. I'll mention their names because they were so important to me. It was because I had those interactions with those people that I was able to go on and, and do what I wanted to do. I, the only graduate school I really wanted to go to was University of Chicago. And I was thinking about this last night, too. I was retracing my, my life in reverse. I, I live in New York now, so I flew from New York to Chicago to Springfield to here. Uh, you know, drove here. And so, you know, in reverse, I went from Hurley to Springfield to Chicago to New York. Um, but... Chicago was a fantastic place for me, and I, I had a lot of experiences. And, and if, if you aspire to go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or University of Chicago or you know, UT Austin or wherever it is that you want to go, just believe that you can do it. It doesn't matter where you come from. So really what I want to talk today mostly is about science. And many of you learned in grade school, I know that there are some kids in fifth grade here, young adults in fifth grade here, you've learned the scientific method. And the basic idea of the scientific method is that you start off with a question, something that draws your attention, makes you passionate. You want to know more about this thing. So you do some research and you make a hypothesis, come up with some sort of possible answer. And then you test that hypothesis and you gather data and you analyze those data and you make conclusions. Now, if someone had discovered penicillin and never told anyone about it, we would be in a world of hurt right now, right? The world population would probably be a third of what it is. So the last step of the scientific method is really to communicate results. Now, science is almost never this tidy. Um, there's a lot more blood, sweat, and tears that goes into science. You do start off with that question about which you're passionate, usually. 
Um, and then you, you do this research and hypothesis, and usually about the time you do make your hypothesis, you realize you don't know what you're talking about. So you do more research, and then you test your hypothesis. And then you analyze the data and make conclusions. And then, then you really realize you don't know anything at all and that you're completely in the dark. So you do more research and more analyses. And at some point, you just realize that you have to start communicating these results. So science becomes very cyclic. And actually, this is the same thing as life. Um, all of these things that you, you think of as part of the scientific method goes into life as well and seeking out the things that you really want out of life. The important thing is to really find what makes you passionate and go after it. So what's always um, been interesting to me has been reptiles in the natural world and paleontology. And I was very lucky that I had uh, parents who um, took me to the zoo all the time and, and really fostered this interest in me. Now, as a paleontologist, I sometimes get a little bit of grief from uh, other scientists, some of my friends. They like to give me a hard time because we as paleontologists aren't always on the cutting edge of technology, right? And I'll give you some examples. I mean, um, a tripod that we use to load our trucks in the field is something that is, you know, was cutting edge technology in the late 19th century. Uh, the advent of motor vehicles have allowed us to get caught and trapped and stuck in more and more remote areas over the last hundred years or so. And, you know, if you go to a genetics lab, the basic unit of work is a pipette or some sort of fancy chemical or some sort of uh, machine that can analyze the genetics or, you know, but our basic unit of field work is actually an awl, which is basically a sharp pointy thing that you use to dig in the ground. And this has been around for even longer. <laughs> but as paleontologists, we go to these, we go to pretty remote places and often we don't have much with us. So we are forced to improvise and we can do that in the lab as well. So something that's been happening a lot more over the last 10 years, really it's been going on for about 25, but over the last 10 years especially is we've started co-opting fancy medical technology. And so what we have here is a, um, a lizard skull. And I wonder if this pointer shows up. Can you guys see this pointer? Okay. So this is a lizard skull. You're seeing it from above. Here's an, here's an eye. Here's an eye over here. The end of the snout's gone, and the back of the skull would have been here. Now, this skull is about the size of my thumbnail. So it's a pretty small skull. And it looks like a generalized lizard. We couldn't tell much about it by looking at the outside of the skull. But when we CT scan it, we can blow everything up. We can look inside the brain case of this animal, the part of the skull devoted to holding the brain only. And what we see is not a generalized lizard when we look at it this way. What we see is a relative of lizards. Now, this skull is 130 million years old. And the earliest gecko fossils we know of were about 40 million years younger, so from about 90 million years ago. And by looking inside of the skull, we can see little tiny details that show us that this is related to geckos and that geckos became like geckos today inside of their skulls long before the outside of their skulls became gecko-like. And that's just one way that we use modern technology to, um, we co-opt technology that was never meant for paleontology, of course, and we use it for paleo purposes. And as we do this, our understanding of our, the animals that we know and love continually evolves. So many of you will be familiar with the velociraptors from Jurassic Park, right? How many have seen Jurassic Park? All right. First of all, let me, let me take a step back. This wasn't something I planned, but you remember at the beginning of um, Jurassic Park when they shot that thing in the ground, they got that beautiful picture of the skeleton in the ground? That's total bull. We don't have anything <laughs> like that at all. In order for us to find fossils, we have to go to a place with little ground cover, which is why we go to places like the Andes or to the Sahara or to the Arctic. We go to places where there's very little covering up the ground, and we walk and walk and walk and walk, and we look at the ground. I'm great at finding four-leaf clovers <laughs> because I've walked and looked at the ground so much. But anyway, so in paleo, our ideas of some of these animals um, is constantly evolving. Now, the real velociraptor is only about six feet long and about knee height to me. So this is actually an animal called Deinonychus. It's much more like the animals that they call velociraptor in Jurassic Park. And when this thing was first discovered in the late 60s, it helped to revolutionize the way we thought about dinosaurs. Up until the, around the 1960s, we thought of dinosaurs as sluggish animals, stuck in swamps, 
couldn't move around easily on land because they were too heavy and slow and stupid. But Deinonychus helped us to understand a different type of dinosaur. You can see it has long legs that uh, suggest that it was probably a fast runner. It has that giant claw on its hind foot that it probably used to eviscerate other animals. Um, long bird-like, uh, I mean, sorry, a long, long skinny tail, a bird-like rib cage, a bird-like head, had air sacs. So this animal really changed what we thought. But you can see that we still, this was a, an image made by a guy named Bob Barker. Not Bob Barker, he wasn't trying to make us uh, spay and neuter our cats. This is Bob Barker, who, who was a paleontologist working at Yale at the time. And for about 25 years, this was our idea of Deinonychus. And so when it appeared in Jurassic Park, it still looked like a big, very active, very um, bird-like, but still very lizard-like animal as well. But since the mid-90s, we've started to understand a lot more about Deinonychus and its relatives. First of all, we recognize now that they are closely related to birds, that birds are dinosaurs, just exactly the way that bats are mammals. Just because they started flying and look a little different doesn't mean that there's something different, right? They're, they're just a type, a specialized type of dinosaur. So we now know that something like Deinonychus would have been covered with feathers. And not only would it have had feathers, it would have had wings. And the really strange thing about it is they didn't have wings just on their arms. They had wings on their legs, too, and a tail fan. So our, over, since the 90s, our understanding of Deinonychus has changed dramatically. So that today, if we know that if you were to see a Deinonychus running around, you wouldn't say, what a weird-looking lizard. You know, that's, that's a crazy-looking lizard you would say, that's a really scary bird. <laughs> that's a 100-pound bird with giant claws on its feet and teeth in its mouth. And it even had little claws on its wings. This, this illustration doesn't highlight them, but there's little claws on the wings, too. So over the past decades, our understanding of these animals has tr changed dramatically. Now, a lot of paleo has to do with field work, and a lot of paleo has to do with lab work. And Probably 90% of most paleontologists' lives are spent in the lab or in front of computer screens looking at data. But that's not very interesting to talk about, so let's skip over that. Um, <laughs> what we get to do is to travel. And I've been especially fortunate in the places I've gotten to do field work. And then I've also done some, uh, visited other places to view collections and study. But I'm not going to talk about all of this. I'm just going to talk about a few of these. And the first one I want to talk about is my very first trip out of the country, which was to the Sahara Desert of Niger in the year 2000. And we had five camps in Niger. We were there for 14 and a half weeks. And there's where uh, the localities were. Now, the desert can be strikingly beautiful. Um, I would point out that we normally got up before sunup. This is uh, the lazy member of our crew, and, but it made for a really nice photograph. So it's, it was way too hot to sleep in tents in the desert, so we had um, cots for the first several weeks. But the sun was so intense that the canvas of the cots just um, deteriorated and collapsed. So for about 10 weeks, we were sleeping on, um, on the ground. We slept outside for 92 days in a row. Um, the most important thing for this is to be prepared to make sure that you have everything before you go on these trips and to be mentally and physically prepared. This is our camp. We actually had a National Geographic photographer with us for part of the time, and he rented a plane uh, in town one day and flew out to, to look at camp. So this is our cook tent, this is our gear tent, um, and this is our library tent. And here you can see we're trying to save those cots. We have a, a tarp over them. Um, these three vehicles were the ones we used to go out to the sites because we would go out two or three miles to different sites. This thing never moved the whole time we were at this camp, which was about five weeks. It broke down and, and didn't move. We had to push start vehicles every day. Uh, and then these are some of the, the fossils we'd collected. And then this is a photography tent. So you can tell it's kind of a moonscape. There's not a whole lot of vegetation. Here's the restroom. Um, and it was dangerous to just even walk around out there. On days that we were prospecting, you know, I told you that we would, would just um, walk and walk and walk and walk and look at the ground. Those days you needed to wear closed shoes. And, and then on the days we were working in one spot, like digging something out of the ground, you could wear sandals. And obviously Allison didn't realize this day that she was going to go walking around. So this was a pretty minor injury. Um, the, there, we were as, much, as many as 13 hours away from a road or a town, 
So we, our base of operations was this town called Agadez, which you can find on Google Maps now, which at the time you couldn't, but um, now you can find it on Google Maps. And it's, it's in, kind of in the middle of Niger. And we, when we left to go to that first camp, which was a place called Gadafawa, um, we just drove to the edge of town and drove off-road for 10 hours, which is only about 100 miles because this happens every couple of miles. Um, plus, it was 130, 140 degrees a lot of times, so you had to stop and let the vehicles cool down every few miles. Also, we had kind of um, suboptimal leadership on this trip, and so we were using old tires, so we had flats constantly. So we also um, lost our water once. We, we were drinking between seven and nine liters of water a day per person and peeing twice. Um, it's a little gross, but it gives you an idea of how, how hot it was. The uh, hottest day we had was 144 degrees. We ran out of food once um, at the end of the trip. We nearly ran out of water three times. Uh, this was the first day that the water truck arrived. So these big Mercedes, um, they're actually designed in the 60s as, uh, for desert warfare. But now they use them in Niger as water trucks to come and deliver water. You have these three giant 800-gallon water bladders that we set in the side of the hill. And the, the water truck, it took about two weeks, but they got to us and um, filled up the water. But before then, we were sending someone back to town uh, every three days to go collect water in these little jerry cans over here. And you can see we're very excited to have water coming. Uh, this water was full of rust, so we couldn't drink it. Um, so then they painted the inside of the water truck and came back with water, but they didn't let it cure. So the next water tasted like um, uh, paint. And so finally, on the third trip, we got our water. Now, you have uh, 2,400 gallons of water sitting in rubber bladders in 120 degree heat. It starts to smell like a uh, swamp right away and kind of tastes like one. So we did a lot of filtering of water and a lot of um, uh, drink mix. But you can see the Sahara is beautiful. It's very different from the deserts of the American Southwest. There's almost no vegetation, uh, but it's really good for finding fossils. And that's what we did. We, found, uh, we ended, up, ended up getting 20 tons of fossils. We got 10 new species of dinosaur, four new crocodiles, two new turtles, uh, parts of several fish, and parts of lots of animals that had been collected previously. So once you find something, you start to solidify it with some very thin glue that you put on the surface. Then you dig down around it. Uh, eventually, you're able to cap it in plaster and then undercut it. After you undercut it, you flip it, and this particular jacket was about 800 pounds, so we couldn't do it by hand very easily, so we used a vehicle to flip it. <laughs> and then at the end of the trip, we, didn't, we were much more productive than we anticipated, so we ran out of plaster, and we were using, of course, duct tape to uh, close up these jackets at the end of the trip. Um, this was actually the night that we ran out of food. Uh, we ended up, we found that we had a can of uh, tomato sauce, a can of uh, pineapple, and a can of tuna. And this was to feed uh, 14 people that night. And instead of eating these things individually, which would have made way too much sense, we had an undergrad who was in charge of food that night dump it all into a pot and warm it up. And that wasn't very tasty. <laughs> it was actually very tasty, but it didn't taste very good. Um, so this is what the stuff looks like coming out of the field. Um, I talked about the alls before. Uh, while we were at this first camp that I was talking about before, the first of five, we'd been there about four weeks, and um, a group of bandits came in. Uh, again, we were 10 hours from a road or a town, so we didn't have anything valuable, really. But they came in and shot their automatic rifles in the air, put a gun in each of our faces, and demanded money, which we said, all right, why would we have money? Uh, and then they popped the tires on all the vehicles. And um, we had to take the tires off the wheels, uh, cut up the pop tires, and make um, patches out of them that we then hand sewed onto some of the other pop tires and then got those back on the vehicles. And that's how we got back to town. They didn't hurt anybody, though, so we were fine. Um, after that, we got armed guards. <laughs> which I don't know why we didn't do that in the first place since Niger has, is pretty tumultuous. Um, but there they are. Uh, this guy right here, I never knew his real name. He only went by Rambo. Uh, <laughs> these, guys, these guys had never seen a body of water larger than a large pond here. So when they would ask me where I was from, they didn't speak very much English. I didn't speak very much French and no Tomacek. Um, I would try to explain to them that I was from across the ocean. And they're like, so uh, a big pond. I'm like, yeah, really big. He's like. Um, you know, 100 meters? And I'm like, no, a little bigger than 100 meters is the Atlantic. 
Um, it was good to have the armed guards, but every once in a while they would see a gazelle off in the distance and they'd take a shot at it. And we were a little bit on edge having been shot at recently, and so that made us a little nervous from time to time. But we found a lot of cool stuff. Um, I mentioned we found some new crocodiles. Here are a couple of them. This is Caprosuchus, the boar croc. We named it the boar croc. We nicknamed it the boar croc because it had these giant tusks. Uh, this is from an area called Inabangrit, which is about 100 million years old. This is Anatosuchus, the only really major thing that I was able to just pick up. I was walking across some open sand and, and looked down. There happened to be a skull on the ground, so I picked it up and put it in my pocket. I'm like, well, that was cool. Uh, this is called the duck croc. Um, we also collected an animal that had been previously known called Sarcosuchus. This is, there was a National Geographic special about this. They called it the super croc, a name I hate because it's sensationalist and stuff like that, but it, it did get a lot of attention. Um, so the lower jaws are, are here. The skull in this animal uh, gets to be a little over six feet long, and we're laying out behind it to illustrate where the arms and legs would have been in the tail. And uh, fun fact, this guy had just passed out when this picture had been taken. Uh, it was 132 degrees that day, and we were laying on the ground for about 45 minutes while everybody took photos. And I heard him go, <sighs> and his hands went limp. So that's, that's why his hands were just laying on the ground at his side there. And this is kind of an artist's idea of what this animal may have looked like. It, it's, a, it's about the length of a school bus, and it probably could have eaten dinosaurs. So it was a, a no-joke animal. Probably would have weighed about seven tons, about one and a half elephants that you'll see at a zoo. Another thing we found was a super, super tiny uh, long-necked dinosaur, a sauropod, called Nisiosaurus. And no one can guess where that's from because of the name. Um, it, it's, I say it's super tiny. It would have been about 35 feet long and would have weighed about a ton. Um, by comparison, it is tiny. Uh, if you look at some of these animals that are coming out of South America now, things like Argentinosaurus and even larger animals, you're looking at things that are 130, 140 feet long and would have weighed 90 tons. That's the size of your average blue whale in, in weight. So um, this tiny sauropod was fun to collect. And then Rugops, an animal that I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. I, always, I never work from notes, and so I time myself, and I see that I'm running a little behind schedule, but we'll see. We'll see how this works out. So the next trip I got to go on was to the Canadian Arctic, and it was, of course, exactly like the Sahara, except for in every way. Um, we, we were really remote there. We had to take um, these little twin prop airplanes onto boulder fields, where then we could get helicopters that would drop us at sight. Um, these are the oil drums that they keep on hand to fill, or... Um, not oil drums, but um, petroleum, uh, fuel drums. And we actually had to hot um, fuel our helicopter that day because they, it was too cold to restart the engine. So they had to leave it running while we put um, fuel in the helicopter. And then everything that you're going to need to survive for the next five weeks gets slung underneath this helicopter and flown off, and you watch it go and hope it comes back in an hour or two to pick you up. But it's spectacularly beautiful. We had um, glacier water flowing through our camp so you could just stick your face in the water and drink it. Um, very, very different from the Sahara where the water was always a, an issue. We did sleep in tents here because it was so cold. The wind was a real problem here. Uh, eventually we had to build, I don't have a photo of it here, but we had to build little rock walls around our tent because it would just blow tents away with people inside of it sometimes. And you had to have someone go tackle that tent as it rolled across the tundra. Um, this is our bathroom. You can see it on the back of the shotgun here. And the reason we had shotguns is because there were polar bears. Um, it never got dark, so they couldn't come on us at night. But while we were sleeping, one did circle the, tent, uh, the camp a couple of nights, and we got a, a, a copy of its paw print. We were able, since we're paleontologists, we always have plaster with us. So we made a plaster uh, copy of its footprint. And it wasn't that big of a polar bear. It was only around 800 pounds. They can be over 1,500 pounds. But I was glad we didn't see it because that would have been scary. Um, oh, that's not what I wanted. All right. So this is our site. Um, we spent five and a half weeks up there. We didn't um, have to do much prospecting because we found a site right away. Here it is from above. And you can see the glacier, the two glacial streams coming, one from this way and one from this way. Our camp was about a mile off to the right here. Um, no one lives on Ellesmere Island. This is the northernmost island in Canada. We did see a lot of musk oxen. We saw some uh, Arctic wolves. We saw Arctic, Arctic hares. We saw caribou. Um, the real issue for us here, besides you know, kind of keeping an eye out for polar bears, was crossing water. Um, a water way more than about eight feet wide, something you could easily carry a backpack and leap over, 
that became a serious barrier because if you got cold, it was, it was trouble immediately. It was really difficult to get warm again after you got cold. So that we had to look for the days when the ice, flow, uh, the ice melt was lower. Um, here's Steve Gatesy from um, uh, Brown University working on uh, the fossils of this animal, Tiktaalik. We got about six specimens of this. This is exactly what we had hoped to find on this trip. I was just grunt work on there. I, I, so when I say they found exactly what they wanted, it's, it, it's not bragging. It was all them. Uh, this is an animal that's about 380 million years old. And let me show you. Here are the eyes. There's the nostril at the corner of the mouth. It had a separation between the skull and the shoulder, which is different from fish, but it had internal gills like a fish. Here, I can show you a reconstruction. Um, it had internal gills like a fish, but it had a separation between the skull and the shoulder like a tetrapod, a vertebrate that can live on land. We're all tetrapods. Uh, frogs are tetrapods. Amphibians, reptiles, including birds, and mammals are, are tetrapods. And basically what that refers to is the fact that we have four appendages with fingers and toes, or our ancestors did. You know, whales don't have hind limbs, but they're still tetrapods. And snakes don't have any limbs at all, but they're still tetrapods. But the idea is that this is the transitional form, or one of the many transitional forms that we have now, between a fish-like animal and a tetrapod. So one of the really cool things about this is just in the news again, uh, some of the stuff we collected has been further prepped. Sometimes we collect stuff and it sits in a on a shelf for 100 years before we, we can get to it because there's such a backlog of fossils that we've, we've collected. So this animal, um, we just found out we have a pelvis for it too, and the pelvis is, is also really strange and bizarro. But um, this animal had an upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, and then instead of a hand, it had a fin at the end of its arm. Really, really weird critter. So you can see a fleshy arm here and then the fin at the end. So this was, a, this was a fun find. And then, let's see, I'm actually doing all right on time now. Um, the, the latest trip I've been on, I'm not going to talk about the Andes or the American West or a few of these other places, but the last time I went um, anywhere on a real dig was in 2011 when I went to Rusinga Island in western Kenya. Now this is in East Africa, very different from West Africa. Um, this was actually a British colony originally, so they spoke a lot of English, and this was a pretty posh camp. Um, I'll show it to you in a minute. The idea for this, this was a, we were looking at rocks that were between 18 and 20 million years old on a small island in Lake Victoria, it, which is this giant, uh, it's the second largest freshwater lake in the world in East Africa, and it's, it's just on the very edge of the lake. And these rocks are 18 to 20 million years old, and 18 to 20 million years ago is when we start to find the first apes. So the things that would have been close, kind of like uncles of orangutans and gibbons. You've probably seen gibbons at zoos, right? They're the ones that do the whooping, the whoop, whoop. Um, so this is kind of an uncle of one of those things. And that's what we were looking for. I was there as a reptile expert. I didn't really care if I found any of those things, but they found a lot of them. So our camp here actually had grass. It was only like 100 degrees during the day, which is pretty great if you're in the field. We actually had a shower so we could wash. In the Sahara, we would go you know, three or four weeks without pouring any kind of water on us. You get sores on you after a couple of weeks in 100 degree heat with, uh, without washing. Um, actually, once in the Sahara, I was so dirty that I ran my hands through my hair one morning, and I had a lot more hair than I do now. And um, there was like a, a centimeter, like a little less than half an inch of, of grit on my head. And when I ran my hands through my hair, I got two beetles that I had no idea were there. <laughs> So then every morning I started doing that to try to make sure that no one was living with me. But um, here we had tents that we slept in. There were issues here too. I mean, um, you guys are probably familiar with the Komodo dragon. There's a slightly smaller relative of it that lives in Lake, on Lake Victoria called the Nile Monitor. It's a, it's a six to eight foot long monitor lizard that can weigh 30 or 40 pounds. Not really dangerous, but just kind of unnerving. You know, if you get up to pee during the night and you go down to the edge of the bushes and there's this thing looking at you. And it could take a finger off and if it could take a finger off, it could take other stuff off we won't talk about. <laughs> so you're careful. Let me just say you're careful when you go to the bathroom in the night. And they had a few of those in camp. We were right at the edge of the water, um, so we, we attracted a lot of animals there. There were green mambas and black mambas, which are also, you kind of give those a wide berth. Um, there are fishing eagles. I wish I'd gotten a picture of that. It's, it's like a bald eagle, an American bald eagle, but um, slightly bigger and with a little more white. 
and every morning it would go catch a fish and actually hang out in this tree, no, this tree right here, and eat the fish, and it was spectacular. But it was always kind of behind uh, leaves and stuff. It was hard to get a picture of. The other thing that we had that was actually pretty dangerous was um, hippopotamus. And I don't know if you know this, but people will report to you that hippos kill more people in Africa than any other animal. I actually suspect it's lions because there's this real issue between Mozambique and South Africa and people trying to leave Mozambique and they cross a park at night and the lions eat them. Uh, but hippos do kill a lot of people. And so any time that a hippo appeared, it got our attention. Um, you don't want to be between the hippo and the water because it gets really grumpy. And so what happens is they come out on land at night and graze, you know, they eat the grass. And, you know, we heard one come through camp one night. No one ever was brave enough to stick their head out of their tent and look at it. But um, here it is in the water. And like I said, it, it gets your attention. You know, there were, this was a highly populated island. Um, there's lots and lots of people there. The Leakeys, uh, the people who studied things like Lucy, have been going there since the 40s. Um, and so they've generated tourism, and so it's a very popular place for, uh, for people to live. And it also provides you the opportunity to take really great pictures of cute little kids. These kids were watching us play football one day. And this is a girl who was part of a school group who came by to look at the site I was working. And we had lots of school groups come by, and it was really great to be able to talk to the locals and tell them kind of what was going on. And they got it really quickly. Um, I was digging up a big pile of uh, 15 crocodiles and a fossil hippo. Like, so these were 18 million year old uh, hippos and crocs and other animals. And the kids were like, so the lake, which is over there, used to come this far. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, they, they put it together really quickly. But these little kids thought I was some sort of monster because they, um, they would, I was working on my site one day and they came to the site and they would try to rub the white off of me. They were young enough that they hadn't encountered too many white people and they're just like, why, does, why are you the wrong color? And then they would try to pull the hair out of me. The people there don't have a whole lot of hair, so I, I wouldn't be paying attention. They'd be rubbing my, like, my calf and they'd just grab a handful of hair and yank it out. But they were great kids. They were very super cute. So this is the site. Um, we ended up working for about three weeks at this particular site. We got parts of 13 uh, individual crocodiles that all died in a pile. Probably what happened was that this was where a river came into the lake 18 million years ago. And often when a, a river empties into a lake, the fast moving water of the river will dump whatever is dead in a pile, you know, because it, it slows down as it goes into the lake. And so we ended up with um, a bunch of odd animals, relatives of, uh, you know, cats and dogs. We had hippos and, and other things that are just, you know, we don't know exactly what they were. And this is the animal. We ended up naming it Brochukas after a uh, University of Iowa professor who studies crocodiles. I study mostly lizards and snakes. Um, but, and I knew he was going to be aggravated that I'd gotten all these crocodiles, so I named it after him. Um, the cool thing is the, the reason that we're afraid of crocodiles is because we've always been afraid of crocodiles. Things like proconsul were being eaten by, by um, crocodiles back when we were just barely apes. Now, that last picture I showed you was very involved. We had a couple of different animals. We had a fish in the water. We kind of had an idea of the waterway. We had a, a very lush background. So how do we get to that point when we start with something like bones? Well, Bradley, who introduced me, um, is, has been studying a lot of geology, so we require a lot of geologists to uh, understand kind of the environment by studying the rocks. I know nothing basically about, I'm a terrible geologist, but I'm a decent biologist. And so what I do is I start to look at um, animals that might be closely related to whatever fossil we have. So there are no meat-eating um, theropods like Rugops around today or Tyrannosaurus rex, but we have their uncles. You know, um, people like to say that crocodiles are living dinosaurs. It's not true. They're kind of the uncles of dinosaurs. They're relatives of the ancestors of dinosaurs. But modern birds are living dinosaurs. And so we study these animals, but that only gets us a little way. We start to use what we learn from those animals to interpret the marks that we see on the bones. Like this is a muscle scar, probably where a ligament went across here. And then we have these rough places on the face that was probably covered with keratin, the same stuff that makes up your fingernails. And so we can start to piece together what this animal's head may have looked like. Now what's great is we, we use phylogeny, a family tree, to understand that there are relatives of this thing known from other parts of the world where we have more complete skeletons. 
So we take something like Acasaurus, and we can kind of start to reconstruct what Rugops may have looked like as a whole. But this only gets us so far, right? Now we know what the animal may have looked like. Had big, sharp teeth, had a, a very rugose face. Um, but would it have been colorful? So we start to look at modern animals, and Rugops would have weighed about a ton. And modern animals of uh, this height, so it would have been about the same height as a, a hippo or maybe a small elephant. Animals of this size today are typically brown or gray, very drab colored, right? But the important thing to remember is that most mammals are colorblind. So it doesn't make sense to put like a big colorful patch on the ear of an elephant because it's not going to be able to use it to intimidate a rival or to attract a mate. So would Rugops have been brightly colored? Well, we start to look at other animals that are alive today, and we find that almost all reptiles have color vision. And along with that, most of these things have bright colors on them. This is a cassowary, which looks like you know a, a turkey from hell. It, it'll kill you, this, this animal. It's, a, it's like a small ostrich with a claw that long on its foot that it uses to eviscerate zookeepers and other people it doesn't like. Um, Things like crocodiles are less colorful, but they still have, um, you know, markings on the face. A lot of turtles are very colorful, and a lot of uh, lizards and snakes are very color colorful. And something like Rugops would have been here on the family tree, surrounded by animals that today have color vision and that are brightly colored. And it's worth noting that some mammals have color vision. Many of you likely have color vision. And... Um, Primates are among them, and primates are often brightly colored as well. So when you have an animal that's related to animals with color vision, and you recognize that color vision often goes hand in hand with bright colors, you can start to reconstruct this animal as possibly being brightly colored. Now, this, we only know what a few dinosaurs' colors were. Did you know that we knew what any colored dinosaurs were? In the last couple of years, um, they're, they've discovered that the, the individual pigment molecules that we find in the fossil feathers of some non-bird dinosaurs, actually relatives of Tyrannosaurus rex, can tell us what color they were. There are different shaped color molecules, and they're all named based on meat products. So they're sausage-shaped or meatball-shaped, or uh, there's a third one. It's like frank-shaped, and those tell us different colors based on the shape of those molecules. We, we learn this by studying modern feathers, and then we apply it to the fossil record. So there are a few non-bird dinosaurs from the Mesozoic from 100 million years ago that we actually have an idea of what color they were. But here we're just kind of hand-waving. We, we presume that because relatives of this thing are brightly colored and have colored vision, this animal might as well. We also can start to fill in the environment. There are things like Nesiosaurus and the boar croc in this area. And so we can start to paint a fairly complete picture of the environment in which this animal lived. Now, this comes from the Sahara 100 million years ago, the world's largest hot desert. But we now know, based on geologists and the animals that we find in the environment, that it might have looked a lot more like a swamp, like the Everglades today. Now, we can apply the same type of thing to everyone's favorite, Tyrannosaurus rex, which is, I mean, I, like I said, I study mostly lizards and snakes, and so I feel like Tyrannosaurus gets too much press, but it's still easily the most impressive predator on land ever. There were larger meat-eating dinosaurs, longer at least, but none of them were built like the freight train that was Tyrannosaurus rex. This is our traditional view of Tyrannosaurus rex, very upright, um, scaly, and, and you know, um, look like a big reptile. We've understood in the past few decades that it was probably more horizontal than upright. It was built like a teeter-totter, with this being the fulcrum in the middle. And we always have to allow ourselves to be surprised by nature. And that's what we've really been in the last few years. So about two years ago, or about 10 years ago, we started finding relatives of Tyrannosaurus with feathers, but they were all relatively small. This is an animal called D-Long, which was about my size. But then, uh, two years ago, we discovered U. tyrannus. This is an animal from China, which is a two-ton feathered tyrannosaur. So using everything that I've talked about so far and our scientific method where we keep adding data and data and data, this is probably a more accurate depiction of tyrannosaurus as we understand it now. So this is a six-ton animal completely covered in feathers with teeth like railroad spikes that could have eaten essentially any animal in its environment. Now, that just goes to show you that we always have to allow nature to surprise us. 
Um, no one would look at a fossil goat and suggest that it could climb a tree, but this happens all the time in West Africa. And we have to continue to go out and make these discoveries, look for new things. And this brings me back to you guys. Um, if, just because you're from a small town doesn't mean that you can't go out and do things like this. Um, sometimes the, the path that you take is a difficult one. It's hard to find exactly where you're going or um, the way to get there but you can have the career you want. And the first thing you need to do is be introspective. You know, I've had a lifelong passion. Um, I've always wanted to study the natural world. I've always been interested in dinosaurs and in paleontology and, and lizards and all kinds of different things like that. And that's been driving for me. But not everybody has that. And my wife is a person who hasn't always had that. But she's been able to find her passion, understand her long and short-term goals, like you may be able to, and um, excel at many things. She was a banker, she was an archaeologist, and now she's a paleontologist. This is a uh, medical student who had a passion for understanding reptiles as well, so she did research with me for a year, just because she understood what she really wanted. And this is a crocodile monitor, a close relative of the Komodo dragon that she dissected for me. Here's my wife, she went to the Gobi, she, she goes to Peru every year to dig up fossils uh, from the Amazon. Um, so this is her in the Amazon River, which makes me really nervous because there are piranhas and crocodiles and, and um, caimans and all kinds of nasty things. Uh, but she's digging up fossil mammals there. So the first thing to do is to sit down and figure out what it really is that you want. And then learn from people who say it can't be done. There are going to be lots of naysayers, people who say it can't be done. Sometimes it's out of jealousy. Sometimes it's just short-sightedness. You need to learn why they think it can't be done, because then it helps you to listen to the people with a, a better understanding, the people who want to support you and say it can be done. You have to listen to those people as well. Surround yourself with those people. Let them know your passion. Uh, make the most out of every opportunity. You're going to take some courses in college or in high school or wherever you are that you're not going to enjoy, but find the motivation for it. I took a, a constitution class at Drury, and I could not see how it was going to help me until I realized that I wanted to travel the world, and it's important to understand the constitution of places because that gives you an insight into the philosophy of, of how these people are, to expand your horizons and to understand things. So make the most out of every opportunity, whether it be something directly related to your interests or just something that you have to do. If, as long as you can do that, it helps you to be disciplined, to not be distracted by the everyday things that get in the way uh, and keep, help you keep you, uh, your eyes on your goal. Um, and, you know, King Solomon was known for his wisdom, and he said that whatever you find to do, whatever you're passionate about, let that drive you and do it with all the force that you can. And go out and see the world. Don't be uh, discouraged by... Things. You're going to, there are going to be times when you're discouraged, but you have to keep uh, that discipline and keep moving forward. And um, find, find your passion and do what you want to do. That's, that's really what I want to tell you more than anything. Um, this is my support group, um, and thank you guys all for coming out. Oh, and my wife is doing a, a Google Hangout um, from the American Museum of Natural History in about nine minutes. So if any of you guys want to take down this tiny URL and watch her talk about, uh, she's probably going to talk about dinosaurs from the Gobi and her work. I'll leave this up for a minute. But thank you guys very much for your attention. Thanks for coming out. Oh, my thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. I don't know who did this, but thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you all. You can be dismissed.